and in you, that they also may be one in us. So Jesus is praying that we may become one in them, one in them, saints, and that the world will believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, and that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they, that's us, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you love me. Hallelujah. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, and that they, that's us, may behold my glory. His prayer, Jesus' prayer is that we may be with him. We may behold his glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be, may be in them, may be in us, and I in them. Hallelujah. It's got the love of God that was shed abroad in its heart. God's love came down for us. So because he wanted us to be reconnected with him. It just hurt the Lord so bad that mankind fell away and there was no reconnection without a blood sacrifice. And He came down with the love of God. The love, His love came down with us, for us, and rescued us. And then He's saying that he, He's putting that love in us. And that we can be loved to others too, saints. There's people that need the love of God demonstrated to them. And unfortunately, the love of God is not always demonstrated in the church to the people. Unfortunately, the love of God is not demonstrated to the people in the workforce. The Christians aren't doing a good job of demonstrating the love of God to the world, saints. We, our job is to demonstrate the love of God. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what they're going, what's going on in their life. What matters is, that do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And what matters is, are you allowing them the opportunity to share with them, to show them how they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Or are they seeing the love which should be in you through them? Are they seeing the love of God in you that they can be drawn unto that love? And say, there's something different about you. I know you say you're a Christian. I know you say you go to Victory Church. But there's something different about you. I can feel the love. I can see the love. The love is demonstrated in your life. Hallelujah. And so he prayed that for us. And it's really, we need, we need to tap into that love, saints. Love people. Love the unlovable. But I think I'm still eating that uh, body of Christ, Janice. I took the biggest piece on, on there. That was good. Thank you, Janice. My Aunt Janice made the unleavened bread this morning. That was beautiful. Thank you, Janice. Hallelujah. So let me go down to 18, John 18. And this is where I really want to land on this morning. It says, uh, when Jesus had spoken these words, that's prayer now, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. This is kind of interesting because that brook, Kidron, this is, the, this, is the, this is the same brook that David had to cross over. He passed through to the wilderness when he, when he was betrayed by Absalom. He went through that same brook. And so now Jesus is going over this brook, brook Kidron, and he's passing over it. And he gets... He says, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Well, the devil's good at putting wedges between closest friends. He's done it in the churches. He's done it outside the churches. He's done it at work. He's good at that. But why Judas? Why Judas? I used to, I used to wonder. How did that come about? Well, he drove a wedge in Judas leading to this ultimate betrayal that took place. The devil did. And we can find that in John 12 and John 13. I'm not going to study it out in its entirety, but I'm going to start reading in John 12 and verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed, with, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped her hair, his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance of oil. Well, Mary's doing a really kind thing. 
that's expensive stuff. It's a, a year's wages of perfume. She's, it's a, like a, a, a burial preparation that's about to take place here. But one of the disciples, Judas, Simon's son, who would, would betray him, says, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said, not that he even cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus says, let her alone. He said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. So Jesus rebuked them now. And if you go on to John 13 and verse 2, this kind of answers the question, why Judas? And supper being ended... The devil, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. It happened just before supper ended. Well, when did this happen? It happened when he got rebuked. He was mad at Mary for pouring that oil on the hair, and Jesus rebuked him. And now he has this bitterness of his heart, and boom, whoosh, betrayal came right into his heart. The Greek says put into is balo. I, I put it in your notes, I think. It carries the idea of a very fast action of throwing, a thrusting, or, or injecting something forward. So it was just injected really quick. And this is significant in the text because it shows how fast Satan moved to inject the seed of betrayal right into Judas' heart. And, and this injected seed turned out to one of Jesus' closest, closest uh, you know, people around him closest associates into a betrayer. It's important to learn how to recognize those times when the devil tries to inject a seed, a betrayal, seed of a division into our heart saints. It'll happen. The devil wants to drive a wedge when you and, you and the people you love the most. Relationships that you're in the most. There's a, there's a, he'll drive a wedge in there. And we need to make a decision to resist every temptation to get angry or offended when these people that are in our, our life that are lo we love, that happens to. We need to resist the thoughts. You know, you can stand against the devil and protect your relationship that he'll try to sever. You can do it. Let's continue on in the garden. So we're going in verse 3 now. I want to spend some time here in verse 3. Then Judas, having received a, a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Well, John called them a detachment of troops and officers here. The King James says it was a, it was a band of men. Well, well, Matthew's account in Matthew 26, 47, we're not going to turn there, but he called them a great multitude with swords, Swords and uh, clubs. So there's a great multitude of people that came to the garden. Mark 14 said there's a great multitude. Luke 22 said there's a great multitude. Well, this great multitude is a Greek word, ochlos, or a massive crowd. So there's a massive crowd here uh, in the garden coming to arrest Jesus. And I did a lot of study on it a couple years back. And we did a, if you do a full Greek study on it in Hebrew, you'll find that there was about three to 600 uh, fully armed, trained soldiers accompanied by officers from the chief priests that all came to this spot to get Jesus, you know, defenseless. And, and they came in full weaponry. They had the whole ball of wax on, and they were, they were prepared for a military engagement. Well, Satan was terrified of Jesus, and he has every right to be. He, he always was uh, right from the beginning, right from, from the prophetic death, uh, birth of Jesus Christ. He tried to kill all the babies. When the Messiah was born, he tried to get him to jump off a cliff after fasting for a while. Luke 4, 30, they were going to throw him over a cliff, but he, he slipped away. You know, they were going to kill him right there. He slipped away. John 8, 59, they were going to stone him to death, but he passed by them. They, they failed there. John 10, 39, they were going to stone him again, but he escaped from their hands. So Jesus had a history of just escaping him. Now it was time again, to get Jesus through his betrayer Judas. And this time was different, though. It was his appointed time. It was his appointed time for Jesus. See, no man could take Jesus' life. They tried to take his life before, but it wasn't his appointed time. 
No man takes Jesus' life, but he lays down life for humanity. Amen? So the time had come. And this all came about by, by Lazarus. Remember when Lazarus got, got raised from the dead? The religious, re, re, just a couple of chapters before, Lazarus got raised from the dead. And the religious rulers of that day were infuriated that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And this is it. This came to a head, headwind now. They are going after this guy now. Why in the world? How, you mean on a Sabbath, he raised someone from the dead? I think there should be a lot more people raised from the dead on Sabbath day. Hallelujah. There's a lot of churches on Sabbath day that need to get some people raised from the dead. Praise God. We need to be raised from the dead uh, in our spiritual life, saints, too. I better get, I better, I'm going to get in trouble. I better keep going. It's not about their church. It's about what we're doing here. So here. You know what I mean, though. So they had, they had time. So here we have Jesus. He's in the garden. And he's got these religious folks all stirred up over it. And the multitude was there to arrest him, but they were nervous of him. They heard of his power to heal. They heard of his power to cleanse lepers and cast out demons and raise the dead and walk on water and multiply loads of fish. They knew all about these stories that were taking place. So we're, here we have the soldiers and police ready for an all-out war against Jesus Christ. Mark 14 and 44 says, Now his, now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whoever, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And lead him away safely. And as soon as he, he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. You know, what's interesting about that, he called him Rabbi. He's been with him the whole time. He didn't call him Master. He didn't call him Lord. He called him Rabbi. He called him Teacher, Teacher. Well, his disciples called him Lord, Master. Almighty. Judas didn't have that relationship with the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes we need, uh, we need to get raised from the dead on the, on the Sabbath. I'm not being critical of any denomination whatsoever at all. I'm talking about being born again. Churches need to preach about being born again. Every Bible, the Catholic Bible, the Lutheran Bibles the Baptist Bibles, the Charismatic Bibles, they all have John 3.3 3 in it. Unless a man is born again, they shall not enter the kingdom of God. Amen. That's the bottom line. And so, that's how you become spiritually dead and get resurrected on the Sabbath day. Spiritually. And so I'm not trying to slam on any denomination whatsoever. All I'm saying is, let's preach the word of God. Hallelujah. And so, he has a betrayer now calling him Rabbi, Rabbi. He didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He was just one of those church-going people now. It's one thing to be perceived wrongly but by someone who doesn't know you, but how about someone who knew you? You ever been betrayed by someone that knows you? How'd you like to find, be a, how'd you like to be a, a, have a friend stand with someone falsely accusing you? It's not fun. It hurts really, really bad. I hope you never have to go through it. And if you ever go through it, keep your love of God near to your heart. And don't ever go after those people. I'm just talking from experience, saints, too. I got hurt really bad by people in my life. I refuse to go after them. I refuse to expose them. I refuse to bring any art against them. And so that's what we need to do. And, but it hurts. Jesus never fought back or questioned Judas, did he? He didn't. Verse 4. That Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. And when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
And so this is where it gets really, really interesting. Did you notice that? After Jesus received Judas' kith of betrayal, he stepped forward and he asked the militia there, he, he says, who are you seeking? Who are you guys seeking? Because he's trying to get something out of there. He, want, he wants to get an answer out of them. He knew who they were seeking. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, you know, I was just thinking, in the, it must be a spiritual thing here now, the Holy Spirit. I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even call Jesus, Jesus. They'll call him the Christ. Call Jesus, Jesus. He's Jesus. It's precious. It's precious. But they called him Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. You notice as soon as he says in verse 6 that I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I just saw that you know, a couple years ago and I preached a lengthy th message on that. It's powerful. What caused the power to be released? The words, I am he. Jesus also used the words to identify himself in John 8, 58. Most assuredly, I said to you, before Abraham was, I am. And these are the very words God used to describe himself on Mount Horeb in the Moses. It says in Exodus 3, 14, it says, I am who I am. And so the soldiers want to know, who are you? And they probably expected him to say, Jesus of Nazareth, but instead he answered, I am. They're powerful words. And as soon as he said unto them, I am, they went backwards and fell on the ground. The Greek meaning of went backwards to pick someone staggering and stumbling backwards. I mean, they were staggering and stumbling, and they went backwards, and they fell. Depicts a person who has fell so hard, appear that they were dead, or fell on a corpse. So you have 300 or 600 people that are dropped like a dead corpse, laying all around them, because Jesus says, I am the great I am. There's power in those words. Hallelujah. The members of the militia that came to arrest Jesus were knocked flat out by some kind of power, saints, some kind of force. Matter of fact, it says they fell to the ground, or the Greek explains that the soldiers falling suddenly and hitting the ground hard. Some force suddenly, unexpectedly, forcefully knocked these, these troops and temples, please, flat. Kind of like when he was fighting last night. He got in first round. He knocked that guy flat to the canvas. There was a power that came into that ring through the fist, through the forearms, through the shoulders. There's power that hit that person. But that was a physical power. But there was a spiritual power with three to 600 people around. And when that spiritual power hit them, it knocked them flat out, cold out. And there was no one to start counting the ten count because they're all out. Hallelujah. That's the God we serve. That's the power of God we serve. That's the power of Jesus Christ. He is the great I am. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't ever diminish who Jesus is. He's just not this nice little baby that came into a manger and grew up and he died for you and I. He's the great I am, saints. And we get a realization who he is. We'll have a better understanding of who he is. You're going to start seeing many more things happen in your own life as you embrace the great I am. Hallelujah. Oh, man, this is good. And so, where are we at in this? Verse 6 or something? Yeah. Just think about three to 600 Roman soldiers and a large number of trained temple police had come to, with weapons and swords and clubs to capture Jesus. And, and they had announced that they were searching for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered with, with the simple words, I am. They're not simple though. I am. Thus, and, thus identified himself as, I am of the Old Testament. He recognized himself as, I am of the Old Testament. And when Jesus spoke those words, a great blast of God's power was unleashed. It was so strong it literally thrust the troops and police backwards, causing them to you know, go, look like drunk men hitting the gr ground hard. And what a shock it must have been. What a, for all these military men, they discovered that the mere words of Jesus were enough to overwhelm and overpower them. Why should that surprise them? They were, they were supposedly serving the great I am, the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They were supposedly serving this God. 
the one that with his mouth spoke the universe into existence. Well, the tales they heard about Jesus' power obviously were correct. And then Jesus said in Luke twenty two fifty one, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. When Jesus says, Permit even this, this was equivalent of Jesus saying, Let me do one more thing before you take me. Isn't that beautiful? He wasn't going to leave that soldier there with his ear off. Let me do one more thing before you take me. Kind of reminds me of someone someone steals something from you. You, you, want my, you want my coat too? You can have everything. You can have everything here, but you can't have you can't have the building. You can have the chairs, you can have the piano. You can if you can get the p building up off the ground and get it down, you can have that too. But you can't have Jesus. You can't have the great I am. You can't have my master, my savior. So hallelujah. So what and so people Peter, what's he thinking? You ever thought about what Peter's thinking? You think Peter must have thought Jesus needed some assistance. I think Peter underestimated the power. Matthew, let's go there quick. I, I, I want to wrap this up here. Matthew 26. What was Peter thinking? You just think about that. Peter, Peter, you idiot. I mean, Jesus just knocked them all out. And Peter comes along. And he says, uh, it says, And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew the sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off the high priest's ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you, not, you think I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then he could, could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Well, here we got Jesus, just to say, basically in a nice way, rebuking Peter. He put that thing away. First of all, he demonstrated his power. And he said, if this isn't enough, I can certainly call on the angels to take care of this situation. I don't need you, Peter. Put the sword away. Well, if you really did a Greek study, and I'm not going to get into it, he struck down. It shows that they were on their backs. He took a sword from the high priest, and he struck downward action and got his ear. But we're not going to get into that this morning. But here we have Jesus saying, I can call for the angels. I don't need to call for you, Peter. I can take care of myself. I can, I can go to God. I can go to, I can go to the angels. God will distribute those accordingly. He had more than enough assistance available if needed. Matter of fact, uh, in, 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 uh, he, he had the potential assistance of 12 legions of angel saints. The only way we could take him was if he allowed it, them to take him. And, and, and he told Pilate in John 19, 11, you could have no power at all against me unless I, it had been given to you from above. Well, what's a legion? Legion, 6,000 angels. He had 12 of them at his disposal, like that. 72,000 angels. Isaiah 37, 36, it said one angel killed off 185,000 people. If you do the math, and you can on your cell phones if you want, but you're going to come with 13 billion, 320 million people that... One uh, a legion of angels, 12 legions of angels could take care of. Well, twice the planet Earth. You think Jesus needed Peter? No, he didn't need Peter. I don't think he needed Peter at all that night. Jesus could have wiped off the entire human race with the combined power, but he didn't, he didn't call for supernatural help that was available to him. Why? Because it wasn't time for him to lay down his life for the entire human race yet. You know what? We have that same help available to us. And we have to understand that and realize that we are joint heirs with Christ Almighty. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we also have angels assigned to us and are at our disposal, saints. So in closing, the Jesus we serve is so powerful. So powerful. The Holy Spirit is so consuming. And there is no force strong enough to resist his power. Nothing. And there is no sickness, no relational problems or issues, 
No political force, absolutely nothing has enough power to resist the supernatural power of the Holy One Saints. And this is the power that operates in us through the Holy Spirit, 24-7, at our disposal. Don't underestimate this power. Remind yourself of this power. Remind the devil of this power that belongs to you and that belongs to me, that belongs to us. Remind the devil of power that lives inside of us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. If you're a born-again believer, you become a new creation. Old passed away, you become new in Christ. God Almighty, through the Holy Spirit, comes and lives right on the inside. Your spirit, man. Remind the devil of that. Remind yourself that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead also lives inside of us. Remind yourself of that. Finally, remember Jesus' prayer to us at the beginning? Remind yourself of the love Jesus demonstrated for you and I by laying down his life for us. Remind yourself of the opening scripture where Jesus prayed for us. We, we may believe and be one with, with them and in them. Remind yourself of that. Remind that you may behold his glory and be with him where he is. Remind yourself of that. And remind yourself that the love which God loved us may be in us. Hallelujah. Saints, we serve a powerful, all-consuming, wonderful God. And there's people here that need, need Him. They not only need Him spirit, for their spiritual conditions, they need Him naturally to help Him out in some situations too. So let's just everybody stand up and we're going to pray. We're going to pray to the great I Am. Praise God. Holy Spirit, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. God, you are an awesome God. You are all-consuming, all-powerful. Father, we just lift up every person here. We just thank you, Father, that your desire is that we may become one as you are one with the Father through the Holy Spirit. So, Father, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know that love, hasn't received that love, never really repented from their sin and turned to God to receive the love. God is love. If there's anybody here this morning that says, you know what, I want to turn from my ways and turn to God's ways. As I'm looking around and heads are closed and our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to pray with anybody that says, include me in that prayer. I want to receive God. I want to receive God right now. All right, I see that your eyes. Anybody else? I want to receive, I'm going to repent from things I've been in. I just want to turn my life around, turn to God. Anybody else? See your eyes. All right, Father God, we thank you for this couple that need you in a greater way. They know you as the great I am. They need to know you as the great I am. Father, we've done other things in our life that we've done our own way, our way, not your way. So we turn from our ways and we also repent from our ways and become one in your ways. We pray, Father, that you'll just fill this couple with your spirit in a powerful way to draw them closer in, the, in your ways. And, Father, that as they grow in the things of God, they'll get to know the great I Am and the dimension of Him in a more powerful way. Father, we know by the Spirit there's been a high calling placed on this man. And Father, we just thank you that you've kept him, protected him, covered him, 
and are faithful to forgive. Father, we just pray for everyone here. We pray for Mark right now, Father, that the great I Am will visit him in a powerful way. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke those cells, those cancer cells that don't belong in that brain. In, in the name of Jesus, the great I Am, we speak life, we speak wholeness over that head. We command Caesars to leave in Jesus' name. We speak life to come forth in Jesus' name. We speak vision. We speak wholeness in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, you created us. And now we come before you and expect and believe in your word that we're one with you and stand in faith with you in your word that he's whole. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We all want to get to know you in a greater way. Become one in you. We pray, Father, if anybody struggling with anything, that you'll help them through it. Lead them, guide them, direct them into your path of righteousness. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, go ahead and be seated. We're going to, I'll pray for the food. We'll receive a tithe and offering for the church right now too. Ushers have envelopes. If you, if you have cash and you want to give by envelope, raise your hand and they'll get an envelope in your hand. If you need an envelope, if you, if you have a check, just to go ahead and just write it out to Victory. Victory Church or however you want to do it. I'm telling you what, we serve a big God, an awesome God. And he's doing wonderful things in our life.